in this scene, I have an emitter. This is the classical out emitter with a turbulence on it. And uh, you know that if I move the time slider forward, it will it might start skipping and won't look very neat. And if I go one frame back, the whole simulation is gone, and uh, I cannot really scrub well this way. Um, the other problem that I would have, if I wanted to render this as uh, particles, I can um, open my render settings, and um, I can probably render in the in the view as it is. I see the particles, and they're not too many. If we take a look at the console, we're creating only 21,000 particles right now. If I enable motion blur and try to render these particles in the um, editor, I won't see any motion blur. And that's a limitation that we encountered. We have to go step back, half a frame back, in order to figure out, or whatever the uh, shutter angle is right now, half a frame if I have a full frame shutter, 360 degrees. So rendering with motion blur doesn't really do anything here unless I render to the picture viewer. Then I'm going to see something happening. And what do I see? I see as if I went back in time, uh, one frame, uh, I'm getting motion blur, but the simulation is wrong. That's not good. And that's a limitation of the emitter. So you're forced to actually save your particles before you use, you use them. And saving of particles happens in the Cryptorius interface by going to the output settings and selecting instead of viewer, you select save particles to a file sequence. You specify what channels you want and any information about the file name. You can uh, then specify the location where it should go. It basically uses the saving settings of the project. Uh, and then you uh, pretty much hit the render. Uh, instead of rendering current frame, you will render the uh, range. And instead of rendering images, we'll actually write PT files to disk. I have already written those PT files to disk, so I don't have to do this. I'll disable my emitter, and I'll disable the source that I'm using. I'll enable the PT loader that uh, I have. And here you see that the particles are playing now back and forth in any direction. I can render them in the view, but I'll still get, want to get motion blur because, as I mentioned, that's a limitation of the view. But if I render to uh, with uh, motion blur the same particles through the picture viewer, uh, they are actually going to start blurring. And I can uh, increase the shutter angle, which is kind of ridiculous, through 10 frames open shutter and that will start blurring them a lot more. So I'll go to 20 passes in order to get more, uh, um, like passes in order to re reduce the stepping. I still see some stepping. I can also enable the jitter motion blur and that will produce slightly more random distribution. If I go to about 32 passes, it will probably be smooth enough for the distance that the particles travel there. Here we go. So this is kind of neat. and. Um, if I wanted to uh, render this particle system with a regular uh, motion blur, the shutter set to one frame, and they are blurring a very little, a little bit only, and I wanted them to uh, take this uh, particle system, clone it to the side, and render this one with more motion blur than this one, even though they're exactly the same system, I can do this. And I can the way I can do this is just adding a scale uh, channel tab. And in this tag, I can... Uh, say that I want to scale the velocity, and I want to scale it 10 times. And you actually see the velocity is being displayed 10 times longer now in the viewport. And if I render the true, uh, the one will blow more than the other. So once again, you can use the, the tags for scaling, setting, and uh, uh, copying channels around uh, to do certain things that are not necessarily physically correct. Because if I render an animation, the particles will blow like they're moving fast. But in fact, they were moving exactly as slow as the other particle system. So it's not exactly correct, but it might be the effect that you're after. OK. Um, we can also retime a PT loader. If we take a look at the settings, currently we are loading a frame here. And uh, we have picked a single frame from the whole sequence, only the uh, very first frame, the 0001. I mean, 0000. And if I disable the sequence option here, nothing will really load because there are no particles on that first frame. <coughs> Sorry. If I actually load frame 50, it's going to now show frame 50. Uh, and it actually said, hey, that's a sequence. It should be on. 
if I uh, have entered frame 50 and then disable the sequence, that frame 50 will be shown on every frame. And there is the checkbox that says keep velocity channel. Now they kind of disappeared because I'm showing velocities and when there is no motion, the velocity show nothing. If I switch to points, you see that now I'm seeing the particles, but if I would render them, since I disable the option to load the sequence and I disable the option to do velocity, right now the velocity is automatically set to zero because those particles are not moving anywhere. So rendering with motion blur doesn't actually produce any motion blur unless I check the option that says keep velocity channel. In that case, the particles will be actually drawn with motion blur and you'll see a little bit of difference from the, from the blurring. I'll uh, increase this one again to uh, 10 frames so it's much more obvious that I'm actually blurring anything. So this is with the option uh, keep velocity channel on. When I disable it, since I'm loading a single frame that cannot have an animation, it draws it 32 times but it doesn't really move them anywhere. That's why we have this option when you are doing uh, single frames that are not moving, but you want to appear that they should appear like they're moving. Now, uh, if that uh, sequence is enabled, you also notice that actually in this folder I don't have one sequence. I have 10 different partitions. And this is basically the same simulation saved multiple times with different randomness. Um, if I look here, uh, the file name is called part 01 of 10. And if I start going down, you see that we have part 2 of 10 and part 3, 4, 5, down to 10 of 10. So when I was saving my particles, I actually went into uh, the settings here and said I want to save 10 partitions or 12 or whatever. And uh, when I was uh, incrementing the random seed, each time the particles were saved, the simulation looked slightly different because the initial position of the particles when they were born at the emitter uh, was slightly different. And now I can actually enable this option since I have 10 in the folder and it also finds them, says I found 10 partitions according to this file name. I can start increasing this number here and each time I increase it more particles will be added. The reason I'm doing this in this case is the emitter of Cinema 4D cannot create more than 10,000 particles per second. This is the top limit. And if you want to create a million particles, you have a long way to go. And the only way to do that is to actually simulate the same emitter multiple times, hundreds of times, uh, in order to uh, accumulate enough particles to produce the one million that you need. So right now, I'm not exactly at one million. But if I would render this as it is, uh, and we take a look at the console, uh, we are now rendering uh, almost 200,000 particles instead of uh, the previous 16,000. And that, of course, looks a lot more dense. So this is about the partitioning loading. Let's keep it back to uh, loading a single partition only, as it was. Um, loading the sequence and from loading the velocities and everything. I have also the option to enable the playback graph. And that's very similar to loading a single frame. When I check this one, the particles disappeared. The reason this disappeared is the playback graph right now shows frame zero to be loaded. And I can change this one. And this actually gives me what frame I want to load at the current time. And each control in Cinema 4D uh, in the exposure of Crypto is keyframeable. So what I could do is I could go and say on this frame here in the beginning, I want to be on frame 50, for example. I'll, um, I'll go here and uh, actually set a keyframe for this on this first frame. Then I'll go to uh, frame 50, the actual frame 50 of the scene. And I'll go here and say, let this be zero. So right now I have an animation that plays from 50 down to zero and then I can go back and I can say now I want to go up to 100. So this will play back a lot, fast, uh, a lot faster. In the first part, over 50 frames you're playing 50 frames as you would expect. If I display the velocities as they are, you'll see that the velocities actually scale out. Uh, in the beginning they start accelerating and then they go down and then from zero now we are playing twice as fast and the velocities are actually scaled automatically and they are twice as long. So uh, this is kind of uh, nice and actually I uh, went to frame 100 but the frame 100 doesn't exist. I have only 90 frames simulated. So what I can do here is I can say even though I keyframe this one to 100, I know that I only have from zero to 90. I can enter that number here and say when you reach 90, it's okay to keep the last frame. So it comes to here, reaches 90, and then the velocity slowly goes down and it stops 
the, uh, over the last 10 frames, it actually trying to load frame uh, 100, but it cannot. It still loads 90. I can also, instead of holding, switch it to blank. So when it comes here on frame 90, uh, here we are requesting frame 91. It doesn't exist. It says blank. It outputs nothing, zero particles. So you have the ability to either hold it or clear it. The same is for the beginning. If you try to request a frame that doesn't exist, you can set this one always to the valid range. And if, for whatever reason, an invalid frame is being requested, you can do that. You also have the offset. And the offset basically just shifts uh, the timing. So instead of re uh, moving around and retiming the whole playback graph, you can say the whole animation that I just requested, but 15 frames offset. So it, it will be starting uh, at a different time. It, here it ends up frame 15 instead of frame 0, and then it goes up, and then it stops early. OK. Another thing that we want to do here, I'm going to actually disable the playback graph now. Uh, so it plays exactly as it was before. And um, I'll show you under setup what this time offset does, which uh, we saw in the PT bottom, but there it was disabled because it didn't make sense. So uh, currently, each particle is being loaded. It has a position channel, as we uh, probably saw in the, in the settings here. It has an ID channel, position channel, velocity channel, and that's everything that it has. The color is white because it didn't have a color channel, and we assume that that's the color. So currently, we are loading the position. We're drawing the velocity and motion blurring along the velocity, and that's pretty much what is happening. If I change this value here, the time offset, to 1, it's shifting the timing of the particles by one second forward by taking the position in the file, taking the velocity, and projecting forward to a new position that is a frame uh, a second later. If I want the frame, I have to see what my frame rate is and divide 1 by 25 and then use that value here, 0 point whatever. But let's say I want to use 1 tenth of a, of a second. Um, so now my particles are actually offset in time forward. I can go to forward, and you see that the positions where they appear is actually where they would be two seconds later, according to their birth. And then they're still playing with the same uh, positions projected forward uh, along their corresponding velocities. And the result looks very different from the original simulation. So that means that you can take an existing simulation and actually retime it this way by advecting forward in the future along the velocities and produce a completely different look that you might like and might find useful. Another thing you can do is you can keyframe this with an animated sequence or with a single frame. And with a single frame, it makes even more sense. Right now, we are loading frame 50, as you know. I can go now and go to that frame 50 and say, here I have a time offset. I can go minus 2, for example. I'll move a little bit so I can see where it's coming from. Uh, or I can keep it at 0, and then I can go to frame 90, and I can keyframe this. Uh, for example, say, let's say I want to go 3 seconds in the future. I'll uh, set a keyframe here. And now I have a single frame uh, animation, pretty much, hopefully. No, actually, I didn't keyframe this one on zero. Now I have it, hopefully. Now I have a single frame that normally wouldn't play back at all. It would just sit there, showing frame 50 on every frame. And now these particles have been shifted along the velocities and just animate forward in time without any external force or anything. So you can take a static particle cloud that has a velocity channel, animate its time offset, and actually create a quick animation of something exploding along. If they're not going to move around on curves and so on, you just have to move linearly, you can just keyframe that time offset. Interestingly enough, this option is unique to Cinema 4D, and it's not in Maya and Max. You can do it there with the Magma Channel Editor. Uh, but uh, and that's actually the reason why we added the Kid Velocity channel back in the day, because if I don't have this one, nothing will really happen, uh, since I don't have uh, velocity there. Uh, if I go and display large dots, you see that now if I'm playing the time offset, it's not applying because I killed the velocities, and it doesn't have anything to uh, advect by. So this here must be checked in order to get that fake animation. Okay. That was uh, a lot about uh, 
actually animating this guy in interesting ways. I can go and uh, just um, delete the, uh, the whole track so it doesn't have this and so uh, enable the animation again. So my particles are moving. And let's take a quick look at the display. In the display, currently we are showing uh, the loading mode is set to use the render settings. So we look here in the render tab and says load the first 10 particles. If I reduce the number of particles to be rendered to 50%, only the first 50% of the particles will be shown. Uh, and the viewport is also showing always its percentage is always a percentage of the render percentage. So if I go here to 50%, I'm showing now even less particles, 25% altogether. Um, let's keep this one at 100. I can switch the render display mode to every end particle. And if I play back, uh, Various particles will be shown there that, uh, I mean, are just a fraction of the original ones. But you see that when I'm changing the slider, how many percent to show, the particles are flickering because I'm taking them randomly based on their index in the file. That means just in the order. If I switch by a random, uh, like every end by ID, uh, now I'm using a special uh, algorithm that is actually hashing based on the ID channel of the particle and always removing the correct part, the same particles. So it's actually a solid uh, result. And you can keyframe, of course, this over time during the, the animation, during the rendering. You can display particles slowly by animating this. And since the display uh, slider is always connected to the render uh, slider, if this one was animated, the display will also be automatically animated without you having to animate this slider. We have, like in the PT volume, also this limit where I can say I want to show only up to 1,000 particles or medium particles just to avoid um, going overboard. And we can colorize our particles based on uh, uh, any of the existing channels. We know that we have a velocity channel, so I can create a gradient, use the magnitude of the gradient, or use only the x axis or only the y axis, and depending on the value there, or only the uh, z-axis. Um, in this case, it's finding the maximum value for that channel, <coughs> and it's normalizing it within the gradient. So we're getting blue where it's the lowest velocity, and we're getting red where it's the highest velocity. Let's use magnitude, so that's correct what I just said. Uh, I can also do that one, but the problem is that if the velocity was changing over time, that means particles are getting faster and faster, the gradient would be shifting. So particles that are getting faster will get always the red color. And the ones that had before some value here will slowly start going down in the color because in re relation to the fastest particle, they will be slow. You can do it absolute by unchecking the normalized gradient and using your own scaling factor. I, I can enter 0 0.01, that's still not enough. 0 0.01, that's too much. 0 0.005, now we're getting somewhere. Let's try this, that's close. Now the actual distribution of the gradient is based on a fixed scale factor. So if the magnitude has an absolute value, uh, it will always produce exactly the same color. There won't be uh, an adaptive shifting of the gradient based on what's the fastest value. And we can also shift the magnitude itself, has some value how fast the velocity is. I can add or reduce that velocity. I can make the particles appear uh, for the gradient faster or slower than they are in order to shift the gradient without having to move the tags, I mean, the, the flags in the gradient itself. And if I check the option to display the co color in the renderer, then uh, it's going to render with those colors. Right now it's rendering white because I haven't checked the option. If I check it and render again, my particles will render those colors. Uh, 